a very good afternoon to everyone we the team of petroleum engineers association is delighted to organize this webinar session on the theme pore pressure overview causative concepts indication and mitigations by mr pritish mukherjee sir mr pritish mukherjee sir practicing geoscientist with more than 3 and 1/2 year decades in upstream e and p industries in various roles responsibilities and capacities He has strength lies in cross sectional experience of handling GNG operations including deep water and delivering products through optimum inclusion of geoscientific studies and making key recommendation for greenfield development and taking exploration activities in line with block timeline for reserve acquisition experience in indian onlan western shell water and deep to ultra deep water basins plastics and carbonic basin exploration and field development projects experience in indian herring trip basins persian gulf and kuwait oil fields he possesses a positive attitude a team builder and driven delivery through maximum multidisciplinary interaction at this time i would like to tell that there will be a q and a session where you can ask your queries related to topic now i would like mr pritish mukherjee sir to start this webinar session on the theme port pressure overview thank you sir you can start good morning and uh, thank you all uh, first of all i would like to thank uh, petroleum engineers association and nikhil uh, specifically he is doing marvelous job uh, getting hold of industry professionals uh, from academic professionals uh, based on various topics and organizing such lectures which is a way forward actually for the universities and the institutes where related topics are being taught and the academic curriculum does not necessarily touch upon the very basics of the industry related topics and this is uh, definitely a marvelous approach uh, thanks to pea i'm here and um, this uh, i've been told that uh, the primarily um, the participants would be uh, students ongoing students or just passed out or looking for job or they are uh, just start up on the professional line and uh, hence this topic uh, of introduction to pore pressure uh, yeah, overview will be touching upon the very basics and uh, without going into the details and it's it's a pure science and engineering topic and it can itself become a five day lecture session uh, believe me so this is just the basic thing so some of you who are already in this line of uh, pore pressure analysis may find it very basic and boring and uh, but i'm sure there'll be quite a few others who would be interested in knowing the basics and uh, seeing the importance of this particular subject so i'll just go through the things um okay can you see the slides yes sir okay so uh, as i said it will be a discussion thread touching up on just the overviews on pore pressure and the basic concepts and this itself will have uh, most of the things built into this particular chapter of talk and what is the importance of pore pressure Uh, what are the sources or causatives uh, which kind of generate the pore pressure and very important thing because since it's an engineering association uh, many of you would be going forward in line of drilling engineering and this is a topic of uh, must know and uh, to be respected uh, because you have the infrastructure under your control and if you do not take care of this particular aspect then infrastructure may go at a loss so the abnormal pressure indicators during drilling is a very important topics for the engineers as well as the geologists who would be uh, working on site as uh, shift geologists or mud logging uh, mud loggers and data engineers so abnormal pressure indicators hole instability and uh, what are the data requirements for the pore pressure estimation 
so this is just the basics uh, so let's talk about what is bow pressure bow pressure is basically the pressure of the fluid which is created within the pore space of the rock the as you see here i'll just this my one second let me try to get hold of that pointer there's a pointer or we get that yeah okay so as you see this this is a these are the rock grains they could be minerals they could be rocks there is a difference between the minerals and the rocks but let us assume these are rock grains not rock chunks the chunk of rock may have millions of such grains okay so let's consider these three of them and there is a pore space here and if you see here the within the pore space you have two different colors filled in one could be an oil and the other one could be water some of them are called as clay bound water so if it is a clay there is a tendency for the water particles to attach to it it's very important for the petrophysics uh, discipline to know what is the amount of the clay bound water that's the bound water which never comes out you know, get, that is why it's called a bound water that's the free water which is one of the important factor along with the oil or gas which is existing within these pore spaces it's not that the whole rock is full of oil it's the pore space which is full of oil so the pressure is the force exerted which is a standard equation force exerted over an area force pressure of any fluid filled void within the rock matrix can contain gas oil water which i just explained rock matrix the assemblage of the mineral grains in a rock that also i explained so let's go this is the very basic thing so i'm just going to take it slowly build it up because uh, i am not sure how many of you would have even these sort of basic knowledges if you are engineers you definitely have some seminar uh, semesters on geology so you must be aware of it now different types of rocks different types of the textures they behave differently if you look at the this is the same thing that uh, we have shown the previous slide these are the primary porosity sets so why what are the primary porosities and the secondary porosities are the mechanisms of what goes on on the rock after it gets deposited you may have a secondary porosity developing also in a tighter rock it's very very close space so there the porosity itself is a very very small amount and these are in the carbonate carbonate rocks are basically limestone calcium carbonate calcium magnesium carbonate all sorts of carbonate rocks so they have a different behavior why i am saying this is between the sand and the shell and the carbonates the pore pressure topic itself varies tremendously so porosity of the sorted grains and the unsorted grains they look different because you have smaller grains larger grains the there are major porosity there are micro porosities inside now shell why i have put up shell as a separate slide uh, because shell is an important factor which kind of controls the pressure and because shell is very fine as it gets deposited and gets buried in under overburden it compacts the compaction is generally on a normal compaction gradient so if you put put a compaction over millions of years they will have a normal trend unless unless there is a departure from the normal compaction grade and that is a critical factor in determination of the pore pressure because that's the top of the departure is where the pressure is building up the the rock and the fluid escape they are trying to fight against each other and that is where so when they fight they try to adjust the overburden weight that is where the pressure starts building up inside the rock 
So what has happened is the shale used to be a source rock all along because shale is an important factor in generation of the oil, uh, kerogens, which convert into oil or gas, depends on their maturity level. Now what has happened is because that's a kitchen, there is still some amount of hydrocarbon which is already built up and never escaped from there. So shale has become, for the, over the last 20, 25 years, has become a tremendous potential and a game changer in the oil industry and probably a geopolitical issue as well. As you see uh, the relations between different countries. Uh, so US is a major shale gas producer and there are many other countries there. So shale from a source rock potential, it has become a reservoir potential now, but the pore pressure remains constant. The factor of the pore pressure within the shale remains constant. So these are the different attributes of a shale, which I did not talk about it. People must have read it and it will be shared again. So we have a time constraint, so I'll not go into the details of these things. Now, this is this is thing where you see the we, we spoke about shell being a fine grain, it's a very high porosity. But there is a terminology called permeability. Permeability is not necessarily dependent on the porosities. For example, shell has a large porosity, but a very minimal amount of permeability. If at all there are fractures which are connecting the pore porosities within the shell. Otherwise, the shell itself doesn't have any permeability. And that's the reason that if you people search on how shell gas is produced, you'll see that shell is being fractured to create permeability inside. And the fractured dimensions or the reservoir level of contact are made, measured through different seismic, micro seismic technologies. And so shell, uh, itself has a high porosity, low in permeability, and uh, the compaction definitely always happens in a normal compaction grain. So if you see here, the shell porosity is compaction, the sands, then the shell builds up again and again goes down. This is the way the compaction takes place in a sand and shell interlayering. But if you look at the pressures, the pressures follow a particular trend of uh, compaction. Now we come to compaction. Now if you see with the burial, different types of rocks, different types of trend lines, they set provided they're compacting normally. So, so the process, the compaction itself is a process, which I was speaking a few minutes back, in the geological time, which makes the sediment to lose porosity. So what happens during the compaction, you lose porosity at a certain rate. And what happens is the grain to grain contact increases. So in the deposition time, the sediment is mass of open particles. So, you know, the sediment uh, deposition cannot happen uh, if there is no container and the container itself is a bowl like shape which is known as the basins the sedimentary basins what you see normally in sedimentary basins you have anticlines and this and that but those things are involved post deposition of the sediment in a tectonic uh, activity but otherwise it is a pore space which is full of water if you see clay in the rainy days, you go anywhere, you see clay, clay is full of clay particles and lots of water. So if you actually, you can pour them in a glass and pour them out. But then as they go down, today's clay going down and down and over the millions of years, is this water gets out of the mass and the grain to grain contact increases. With continued sedimentation, loading increases, the particle to particle stress build up. So the, that, and with the loading efficient packing, porosity starts to reduce in a normal trend. Why that happens is because the shell particles are more or less similar. 
whereas in the other factors like even in a sand and worse is the limestones the grains are not similar they're different so they're 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 angular and you know they kind of uh, leave spaces they do not have grain to grain contact that well as shell does so so it's a normal trend of compaction which happens in a shell initial porosity so when we start the deposition this is not the same shell sandstones limestones limestones have large porosities actually because they are irregular shapes in the initial stage so when they start compacting they the the grain to grain contact even is geometrical shapes they do not have that well so in a shell there are more similar sizes of grains fine sizes so they compact easily demonstration of reduction in the porosity the depth is clearly seen in the well data and the seismic so you can well data means if you take a log electrologs go down the depth and you see the product porosity reduces even in the seismic this is what you can derive out of it so various levels of the shell porosities if you see on the top left shell porosity is right there on the right right hand corner of the x axis top x axis and this is with the depth how does it go down and you look at the sands very very different limestones far less porosities and they have a different irregular shapes most of the shells have a similar uh, gradient of slope so compaction depends on dewatering so the escape of the water is basically a dewatering effect on the shell so if you see that the bottom left the deposition time clay increasing over burden and then we have the shell which is coming up with facility in between so that now let's see how much of fluid goes out with the depth this is 8 meters fluid loss is 67% then another 100 meters you have a fluid loss of 48% and then another 27% as it goes down and down and down so the ex expulsion of the water from the pore space bulk density increases with depth so what happens is bulk density is the total density so the water is also escaping so the lighter fragment of the density escaping so the bulk density increases now the porosity reduces now what happens is effective stress why is uh, that important factor so after when we understood the shell and the compaction there has to be a component to the effect of the compaction and that is what is effective stress between the grains so if you look at this slide overburden stress so overburden is what now today's sedimentation and whatever ha happens after that the pile of sediment which accumulates after millions of years is the overburden for today's sediment so the total weight of the sediments and the water so eventually what happens is effective stress is the contact between the grains the stress between the grain so it's very important to know the effective stress and that's when the equation builds up in a normal compaction trend very easily that you have a overburden stress and you deduct the effective stress from that then you get your pore pressure so the very basic philosophy of calculating pore pressure is determine the overburden stress uh, stress then determine the effective stress and if you have these two figures then you have the pore pressure at any point of time so tark has he long back many many years back many decades back actually effective stress principle is the same thing so the total stress becomes effective stress plus pore pressure so in a in a case where the pressure increases effective stress reduces because it is the pressure within the pore pore space which is obstructing the grain to grain contact if it is not then the grain will come together and the 
increase uh, stress will increase effective stress will increase effective stress is uh, I, I think this this slide is more or less the similar thing what we spoke about so the three important thing is the overburden pressure so when you plot it this is the overburden pressure and you have this pore pressure you see wherever there is a pressure less pressure the effective stress increases wherever you have more pressure the effective stress reduces so this is just a diagram to show how these three things are interrelated to each other overburden pressure effective stress and the pore pressure now for example this in fact this this is the cartoon is shown like that there is a huge overburden on this man but if he has the strength the strength is the pore pressure then the stress on him will be less this is precisely what is going on down there these are certain um, definitions of normal pressure hydrostatic pressure column pressure of water. pour water from the current depth to the surface so which is the hydrostatic pressure at a certain depth abnormal pressure is where the pore pressure that exceeds the normal pressure so this is where you have the abnormal pressure which is building up so in this case if you plot it in a compaction gradient form the compaction gradient instead of going down like that it will have a departure instead of there there will be a departure here on this side so it will deviate from here on the opposite side on the left it will go so uh, the terms of over, abnormal pressure and the overpressure are sometimes used interchangeably basically overpressure or abnormal pressure abnormal pressure is where in my opinion although the it is interchanged but in my opinion abnormal pressure is where it's not just uh, away from the normal it is also some somewhat uh, not measurable uh, in the pre-drill stage so accurately while over pressure will follow the guidelines of the equations abnormal pressure is often very difficult task to be detected till you go close to the point of where the abnormal pressure lies for example if you have a, a stratigraphic plate a sand lens down there which is charged supercharged mind you the such sand lenses will have a limitations of detection in a seismic so you won't know that now you go and hit that or you go close to the top of that you suddenly see there is a change in all the indicators even during the drilling that's what is abnormal pressure it's not just over pressure it is abnormal subnormal pressure why are we bothered about subnormal pressure because it's it's a very interesting topic in terms of where we have producing fields for decades of production going on the initial setup of the pressure is gone and on top of that the moment the pressure is gone from the initial uh, stage because you are produced fluids from there so what has happened is the production is dissimilar over the whole field it's it's not the similar level of this thing and it's never a subsurface is never that well a layer cake and although reservoir engineers would prefer to have it layer cake because for the computing time uh, on the machine simulation meeting uh, machines but primarily they are not that geometrically layer cake so what happens that the pressure reduction over the field is not going to be similar and as a result when you are drilling a new well you will find a different kind of experience what you never had 20 years back drilling the closest well to that so subnormal pressure is very important in terms of recognizing uh, some 
drilling time losses, uh, stuck ups, differential stuck ups, and all those factors. And that's why subnormal pressure is also to be studied uh, in a producing field. So, overburden stress, we just spoke about it. It's a vertical stress caused by the weight of the overlying formation and the fluids. In an offshore well, effective stress is not sensitive to the water depth. In an offshore, what happens is we have different levels of the water depth. You go to deep water, it could be 1,000 meters. In shallow water, it could be 60 meters. Now, they have a large column of the water, and those water column the depth of the water column does not affect the effective or have an impact on the effective stress so the effective stress again starts to be calculated from the mud line or the sea floor down and in the offshore the pore pressure uh, analysis is done a little differently than the offshore just a little different We're speaking again about the clay compaction, under compaction, and the overpressure. So we were talking about the normal compaction trend, and now we are talking about the under compaction. Uh, what is the difference? It's, there's no difference. Actually, it's the same thing. Under compaction is when there is a departure from the compaction trend. That's it. And that departure uh, is the initiation of the overpressure, which is built up. So that's called a top of geo pressure or over pressure or abnormal pressure. So these are certain equations which you can read later on. Uh, definitions of the over pressure. So you have a, again the overburden stress and the hydrostatic and the, the pressure of the water, whereas it's up to pore pressure, uh, where there is a clearly there is a departure when where wherever there is a hydrocarbon or the water which is not released or dewatered and that has uh, but it could not breach the rock to escape so what happens is it stays inside the rock it stays inside its house the original house and it creates a tremendous amount of pressure on the uh, grains so that is where you see the over pressure top of over pressure and uh, the effective stress difference also you can see here whereas this is the overburden gradient. Basic procedures for the 1D pore pressure. Uh, as I said, the, this chapter will kind of uh, take you through the, uh, the very basics of the pore pressure, understanding the equations and the factors, and the important critical parameters, and also the basic procedures for the 1D pore pressure. So what happens is the same principle of overburden, estimation of the overburden, estimation of the effective stress, and you get the pore pressure. Now, how do you get the pore pressure evidences? The conventional pressure analysis based on the Tergazi's effective stress, which we discussed. So, vertical stress effective st is equal to effective stress for the for plus the pressure on the fluid, pressure of the fluid on the uh, matrix. So this equation, you take it to the 1D pore pressure analysis, calculate the vertical stress from the rock density. So it's a, if you have a density log, most of the wells will have a density log. You can use that. Otherwise, you have to convert it to the sonic, or you can use also seismic data. The vertical stress is taken from the log measurements again, or the seismic, and accordingly, you get your pore pressure. But how do you qualify that? Is it enough? No. There are certain indicators which you need to know are uh, the MDTs, RFTs. It, there used to be RFT or MDT. Basically, we should not be using MDT and RFT because these are trademark names. We should be talking about the pressure points which are taken on the well. Uh, you have some kind of, it is good to always have us shutting drill pipe pressure measurements and for the mud logger and the well site geologists it's good to know about the shapes of the cavings very important these are very very important things these are the there are various types of cavings which uh, talk differently that the shapes of the cavings will have different kind of impacts 
connection gases, which again, a mud logger keeps an uh, eye on that. Connection gases, sometimes uh, purposefully, whenever you have some doubts that the pressure may be building up, the connection gases are increasing uh, as per your pattern, you can just ask the driller to uh, do a pump off and see uh, how it uh, brings up. You know, whether it, that also falls in the same trend line of increasing gases. Hole fillings, when stress related, and drill string drag, and also the trip tank volume. If, we, if there is some kind of a pressure which is gone beyond the, hydro, uh, min, the mud hydrostatic pressure which you're using, then there will be some information on the trip tank volumes. They're increasing. So the volume gain is actually volume which is gained in the well bore and transferred on the surface on the trick tanks. So porosity as a normal compaction, it reduces the velocity in a seismic or on the logs, they will have increase. Resistivity uh, as a factor for tightness, it will increase because when to, and the resistivity increase does not necessarily mean that there is hydrocarbon and that's why the resistivity has increased. So it's uh, even on a clear uh, tightness, which is happening because the grain to grain contact is increasing for a normal compaction, resistivity will increase. Acoustic factor for compaction, again, is an incremental. Now, if you reverse these scenarios, then what happens is your effective stress will be lowered and the pore pressure will be increased. So if you see the resistivity is actually on an incremental trend, starts dropping off, and you see the bulk density along with it also dropping off, and there is a slowness which is coming in the acoustic, then you know there is something happening to the pressures down there. So you, how do you know that there is something? You can stop, have a lag time, watch for the mud, watch for uh, the mud densities, or look at the cavings. These are the indicators on the drill site, which will be very important to follow that time. So the purpose will be to work as a team there, not just looking at my own responsibility. I am a drilling engineer. The other one says I'm a geologist. The other one says I'm a mud logger. No, all these three very key players have to talk to each other and find a solution and save their way. So I think we will stop here for a QA. There are certain options here. Uh, Nikhil already has the answers. Uh, uh, Nikhil, you can take care now uh, for three sure. minutes. Sure, sir. Uh, so, five minutes, I, it's up to you. Sure, sir. I don't, yeah. So, guys, I am unmuting, or you can just uh, keep the answer in the chat box. So, our first question velocity change with depth. The options are where increase reduces or doesn't change. You can keep your answer in the chat box. Okay, that's correct answer. The answer is B, that is velocity change with the reduces. So let's go second question. Normally, pressured cells lose less water with continued burial. The options there are true, false, or not applicable. Okay, that's great. Yes, the answer is false. Third question Sales exhibit. Sales exhibit option A high porosity, high permeability. Low porosity, high permeability. High porosity, low permeability. That's cool. Answer is C. 
Fourth one, with normal compaction, porosity reduces and bulk density reduces. Porosity increases and bulk density reduces. Porosity reduces and bulk density increases. Wow, yeah, the answer is C, that is correct. Let's go to the fifth question. Effective stress change related to rise in pore pressure. It increases, reduces, or not related. The answer is B, 5B reduces. Sixth question. What all geological data change from trend line corresponding to change in effective stress by pore work pressure? The options were resistivity only, velocity only, density and velocity, only sonic and resistivity, density, sonic and resistivity and velocity. Yeah. So the answer is E, 6E. Okay, that's cool. So, sir, you can start again. Yeah, excellent. Excellent, think, sir. Uh, yeah, very good. Uh, and uh, it's, it's very simple, but I purposefully tried to make it a little complicated with different variants. But uh, this is precise. The, the number six is very important that uh, all those data, density, sonic, resistivity, and the velocities are important uh, informations or data that will be required for a pore pressure estimation before drilling. But while drilling is also very important to have all those indicators, uh, drilling indicators uh, to be watched, monitored and actions taken with coordination, proper coordination between the three players, the drilling engineer, model logger and the well site geologist. Okay, so we go to the next one. Nikhil, uh, I'm not able to slide down. Ah, yeah. Okay, okay yeah. sorry. That's okay. So, poor pressure studies the benefits and the importance. We've already spoken about it. But just rush through this again. What are the benefits, especially the benefits? Value additions of the poor pressure studies and analysis. The factor is non-productive time during drilling. If you look at the industry standard, I mean, this is way back, 20 years back, even then. Uh, actually, that is the time kind of pore pressure became a subject of importance uh, in the industry. Basically, uh, it's the deep water drilling, which made insurance companies uh, to have pore pressure estimation before insuring the well without a proper pore pressure uh, analysis done on the well the insurance is not given so uh, the pore pressure basically became a very important factor even then if you look at it two factors pore pressure prediction and the well bore stability they account for how much 44% uh, of uh, uh, of uh, not 44, how much? 37, yeah, 44 percent. The poor pressure well board stability problems account for 44 percent of the non productive time. Means you, if you, I don't know whether you are aware of the cost of one day's spread cost of a particular drilling rig in a deep water, it could be as big as one million dollar a day. And imagine if you have, because of wrong estimations or no estimations or non-compliance with the SOPs on, on the poor pressure and uh, well monitoring, if you get stuck there for 10 days, it's a loss of $10 million. So uh, no company is going to like that. Company management is not going to like that. So what are the effects? I mean, you, are, you will have indicators like you have hicks and the stuck pipes and the lost circulations, hole collapse, back off and low ROPs, tight holes, high torque. These, all of them can account for 
the non productive time during drilling not talking about a blowout that that would be the end of it but i'm talking about if, if you in india there is a bakshan well in northeast which is uh, which got a blowout and dropped two three months back and even now it is not done but expected to be a snubbing to come up very soon snubbing operations but imagine it's it this is the same thing happening in a offshore well is very disastrous companies may close down their business actually but so 8 billion dollar was the npt which cost the industry uh, because of these two factors alone and that is 20 years back so wh what do you get basically uh, it kind of if you do them then drilling and operations you have safety the infrastructure safety and the manpower safety loss of lives drilling costs and non productive time it's optimizing casing program so if you have these things built in you can actually have a better sometimes what happens is uh, you plan a number of casings based on certain informations or some practices done before don't want to change that but if you really have a poor pressure you may end up having instead of four casings or five casings you may end, may end up doing the same well with three casings it's not required you just properly plan the casing points okay so then the optimizing the mud program that is also required unnecessarily we may be using over over mud um, uh, over wet mud and we may not require it the well incidents are reduced well incidents means well saving time environmental impact is that if you can stop your kick and the blowouts even sometimes the wells are drilled near habitations uh, near agricultural fields and you can have a lot of damage done to the habitat habitats around hydrocarbon migration and trapping that is an uh, that's an indicator actually uh, for an exploration well if you have that kind of pressures then it indicates that there has been migration and there has been entrapment and for till then probably it was not known and if all these things happens and you have a somehow a stuck pipe uh, you had to plug them you could not take the pipe out and plug them and go you have loss of data in that uh, well so in terms of reducing uncertainty this is another factor but related to npt why is npt reduced because you are reducing the uncertainty during the drilling so when you start off you have huge uncertainty but as you do a poor pressure analysis and go down monitoring it and while drilling you keep on monitoring and updating the model your uncertainty window reduces and reduces and reduces so it kind of refines your models refines your predictions and enables better decision making so and, and it's kind of uh, saves a lot of uh, uncertainty built into the system value additions of the pore pressure studies as providing stable well bore why is stable well bore uh, very much required it is for the safety of the drill string it's also safety of the logging to be done sometimes the logging is cancelled by the drilling teams because the well bore stability is an issue and uh, we are not talking about actually i'm not going to touch upon that factor as that if you estimate the pressure is that good enough or you need to do something more to know where the stress line comes because your mud bed actually should be above the stress line or stress gradient to have a better well bore not just tackle the uh, pressure because sometimes we have tackled uh, pressures effectively but our hole is very badly shaped badly caved and lots of hole feeling lots of stuck ups because of the not taking care of the stress regime so well bore pressure differential you have different shapes uh, 
for low to high kind of differential you will have different kind of shapes in the well bore okay and uh, so you reduce your with having this you reduce your washout zones breakouts drilling into structures and loss circulation and at the same time what i spoke about is improving the logging capabilities while so like running logging and running casings having a better cement job actually yes if you have very irregular shapes then your cement estimation is uh, improper so sometimes you see the cement loss or cements are not raised up to the point that you would like the cement to be raised and all those factors actually affect on supposing you are perforating there and you have losses happened there then you know the well production well test will results will be very bad value additions of the professor studies again integrated solutions of a cross discipline facilitation now what is this setup this is a setup which is very commonly used by uh, lots of large national oil companies and large iocs uh, it's much like it looks like some kind of a nasa monitoring station so there you have all the departments representatives monitoring manning all the wells talking to each other in a in a base office it's a real time center where uh, the effective monitoring and cross discipline interaction happens in a much faster and the decisions are spread to the bosses or higher ups or the people responsible in a very fast pace uh, and that's where you have uh, proper well drilling done effectively done reducing any kind of uncertain incidents in the well so these are called real time data centers or real time operation control centers there are different kind of names integrated solutions of a cross discipline facilitation now what happens is you have a pre drill so of course pre drill you have to start from a seismic then you have a well data you combine both of them and also then you bring in the basin models so these are the geologists domain where you kind of uh, integrate three different aspects to build up the model and then you start drilling but you don't stop you don't believe this whatever comes out of these three you don't believe it you have to have a proper monitoring on site as well as relaying it to the real time centers so that we have a better match and better way forward and intermediate corrections of the models now this is just a map which shows the abnormal pressures uh, zones areas in the world so lots of them are pocketed in the us uh, even in india if you see uh, on the east coast on the basin and uh, the kg offshore even in the top the daman oil fields i am not sure how many of you are actually from india but some of them are definitely and uh, even in the this place in the arctic circle near arctic circle and if you don't take care of all those aspects that we've been going through for the last 30 minutes or so uh, this is what happens and this is something nobody likes just is not a economic disaster it's a huge loss of human life now again the second uh, stop now this yes, go to the, yeah okay guys again i am opening the chat you can just uh, write your answer so our first question why do we need to do poor pressure studies option 1 we can so management some more information the real time center is fancy reduces uncertainty during drilling yeah answer is 1c reduces uncertainty during drilling so second question lack of pole pressure prediction and real time update can lead to 
saving cost for company in infrastructure and consultancy loss of human life and huge cost environmental concern nothing happen if we are careful great answer is to be now name three important added values of your choice you can just write three important added values of your choice okay yeah just uh, two minutes before sir discuss about that added values anything that comes to your mind yes sir and guys those who are in watching in youtube they can also write in the chat box we will take care of your answer and according to that we will issue your certificate great okay sir i think we have to move ahead thank you participant so what were the general uh, uh, choices that i got from the, we got from the participants so real time data collection use of the same casing optimization mud optimization this reduces cost then well stability then reduce npt reduce uncertainties provide stable well bore then okay. like that's so the same common okay. answer sir okay great thank you so let's go to the final stage and uh, how much time do i have uh, 10 minutes yeah we can go sir okay causes of over pressure a brief encounter see this is typically when i started off when your sedimentation happens this is typically the basin that we were talking about and this is just a cartoon to show those who are not geologists uh, under compaction is the the primary factor under compaction i mean a majority of the pressures related uh, are due to the under compaction fluid expansion uh, this is also there but much more limited and uh, this fluid expansion happens due to two factors like hydrocarbon generation and uh, cracking of the hydrocarbon so what happens is when you you know the buoyancy factor of the oil to the gas this is different so the moment there is a gaseous uh, fluid which is cracking that expands so the buoyancy factor makes uh, the already overpressured section go up due to the gas buoyancy factor and that would be few ppg is higher a uh, few fraction of ppg is higher than the overpressure that has been seen or estimated if this is oil the pressure would follow the overpressure curve if it is gas then there will be a buoyancy factor which will be acted up on that and depending on the structure of gradient i mean that is that some other aspect that we'll be going into clay diagenesis yes this also happens because certain clays when they transform they release a lot of water in them the clay composition itself has water so that water release of water this is a very important aspect that happens in a clay also among the anhydrite rock types evaporite and anhydrite rock types that's where the expulsion of the water happens uh, a large volume of the expulsion of the water happens and if those waters get trapped and somehow they cannot escape then that builds up the pressure aquathermal pressuring this is another aspect the osmosis between the shale and the sand this is where the pressure is transferred it is within the uh, sands various other factors like tectonics you have the different kind of tectonics also take care of building up the pressures today it is not overpressured but a tectonic event happens and it lifts up 
my uh, position of the bed or the stratigraphy up by say a couple of hundred feet or a couple of hundred uh, meters and it automatically what happens is the fluid uh, pressure builds up because it tries to release the pressure which when it goes a depth shifts upward it tries to release the pressure it cannot go out then it gets over pressure or also sometimes what happens is you have this in the deep water you see a lot of them there's a uh, sudden removal of the overburden due to some kind of canyon deep water canyon uh, cut which removes a large volume of the sediments from the top in a very short period of time and what happens that loss of overburden makes the fluid to expand because it finds oh suddenly there is lightness above me so i want to expand and they cannot ex expand so they build up so you see that in the Mahanadi offshore a lot. So the uplifting of value pressures is what I spoke about, which is also related to the tectonic activities. Now this, we, I think we discussed about this a few slides back, uh, how much water gets expelled. This, this is just a cartoon diagram, which uh, explains the volume of water that is being expelled large amount of water that escapes but what if cannot escape means i'm saying that if, if this much of water comes out and there is a uh, there's a seal here on top very effective seal and that seal doesn't let it go out seal doesn't crack seal is solidly sitting on top of that so the pressure within this builds up like exorbitant this is another uh, cartoon of how the depth the normal compact hydrostatic pressure during normal compaction what happens to that the poor pressures these are just cartoons we will go through it the back into the effective stress models this is these are the positives you know and uh, these factors all these factors are interrelated to each other it's a simplified diagram of poor pressure uh, being generated this is the top of the pressure this is the continuous overburden pressure this shows the, that the density with the density or overburden stress is increasing unless there is a canyon cut which kind of drops it down uh, things like that but otherwise it is always a straight line Poor pressure would have normally should have come like this, but something happened which made the pressure to go up because the effective stress reduced. Means the pressure of the fluid inside the rock matrix increased inside the poor places. The poor spaces they increased, and that's how the pressure is built up. Now, that's a quick slide that we went through for the positives this is a very important one for all the three players on the well site abnormal pressure indicators in the well site if you see this is a sort of a monitoring chart in the rop rate of penetration you have this d exponent there's a mud loggers would know what is the d exponent say this is a trend line again it works like the red resistivity that we spoke about should normally be increasing or going flat it started reducing and that's where that is that corresponds to certain other things so what it corresponded to here is that you have this gas units which started building up the flow line temperature uh, increased uh, nickel uh, yes, nickel sir. yes sir, yes sir. somebody raised a hand so we can take a question if you want. Okay, so we'll take at last uh, after five minutes. Okay, fine. So the flow line temperature also increases. So there is a pattern which is setting in. So these are all the indicators. Now gas, uh, there are various kinds of gases to be monitored. Drilling gas, background gas. So you have a background gas tre trend. And then you have this connection gases trend. They all have trends. So any departure, so basic job of 
the mud logger and the geologist is to monitor the trend and the changes in the trends. So that, that those changes have to be explained with some kind of information. Now, rate of penetration. Frankly, if you just take the rate of penetration, it makes no sense. I, between me and Nikhil being two drillers working in two ships, we may have drilled the same rock in two different patterns of ROP with the same bit, frankly. So you have to normalize the rate of penetration. Once you normalize the rate of penetration between Nikhil and me, and then you establish the trends, that makes sense. That gives a lot of values and information. Cuttings and cavings and hole instability. As I spoke earlier, that the cavings give a lot of information about the stress. And also the factors of drilling related factors like torque and drag and uh, hole washouts. Formation temperatures uh, from the flow line temperatures. Yes. Measure them. yes. Can you? Okay. Uh, so. Again, the in indicators are the ROPs, the gases, splintery shell cuttings, volumes of shell cuttings, flow line temperatures, chlorides, shell travel time, uh, the exponent shell density resistivity. These are certain, these, these are totally monitored by the mud logging agencies. Mud logging is one of the cheapest services on a drilling rig, and it works 24 seven and uh, Sometimes that uh, it is not given the due weightage, frankly. But I, I feel uh, having a mud logging, good mud logging unit on the site saves a lot of money and is the cheapest service, frankly. Uh, few examples of the pore pressure and the well bore stabilities. These are just cartoon diagrams. These are self-explanatory with their annotations you can see how the trend trend line shifts as i was speaking to you about the trend lines the shapes of the cavings size of the cavings gases monitoring of the gases and these shell factors these, these are basically taken from your resistivity shell and the sonic shells density shells so these three things to be monitored, but you do not get in all rigs the LWD logs. So these things do not happen, but you update during time to time with the wireline logging as it is done. But if you, even if you do not have this, you have many other properties and parameters which keep pouring in every second and you have to monitor them. So, well, this is the last slide, I guess. It's a vast topic as I started, I'd say interwoven topic between geological building blocks to geophysics, to well operations, engineering and cost benefits. So this topic itself could be fit for a semester. And it is meant for a student overview. Uh, and that too, considering that mostly, probably they were engineers, but I'm sure there are some geologists here I could see one of them who's experienced, but he's there. And attempt is to bring to highlight and respect the importance of the, this is something which I've been repeating. If you have seen all through that, you have to respect each other's uh, contribution in saving the well. And uh, unless you have the respect for each other, you cannot uh, drill a well safely and without NPTs. So, this is all probably from my side. Yeah, any questions? Thank you. Nikhil, I'm done. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So we have uh, one question. Yes, sir, how we overcome from formation if porosity is continuously reduces? Uh, can you come back again, please? Yes, sir. How we overcome from formation if porosity is continuously reduces? How to overcome the formation, you mean to say? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 
Okay. Um, I I don't know what you mean by overcome the formation, but uh, over from formation, sir. I'll just tell you what I'm probably thinking that you want to ask me is that how do we uh, overcome the formation pressure if the porosity is continuously yes. decreasing? Is that that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, yes, the, sir. when the porosity is continuously decreasing, you have nothing to worry about. That follows the normal compaction trend. So what happens is you have the normal compaction trend generated normal pore pressure trend. And in the normal pore pressure trend, you typically what you do is uh, you have a litho column, predicted litho column on the sides. And what happens is you design the engineers will design the casings point on the basis of that curve. And the casings, once the casing is done, e after each casing, you do a leak off test to confirm uh, what is the fracture gradient and how far based on that fracture gradient trend, projected trend, you can go and set the next casing. The importance of that. Well, the drilling engineers uh, uh, many times, especially here I see they are scared to do leak of tests and they do a FIT. FIT works good for a drilling engineer because once you have a formation integrity test done at a certain pressure, up to that point, you can land your casing. Or little less than that, you can safely go and land the casing. So that serves the casing placement part, but that does not give, help us to generate a proper fracture gradient uh, for the field, for a poor pressure analysis. So often what we do is we resort to mini frac tests and all those things to overcome them. So or to answer your question, if it is reducing, the pressure is reducing, you have nothing to worry about. Am I clear? Okay, sir. Thanks. Next question. Sir, enable if we will get both splintery and blocky cavings, how should he interpret that? This is from one of my exploratory bells by Sivata Chakravarti. Okay. I'm repeating the question, sir. Yeah, I got in it. I got it. In, in, at, at a given point of time, you have both the blocky and the splintery cavings. Is that so? So, in that case, in that case, th again, that is a that's a new dimension in the caving which is setting in. It is not that the all the uh, volume of the rock will be blocking uh, caving in as splintery but it clearly indicates that the splintery caving is setting in means there is a stress change that is happening. So you have to be careful and for the next caving to be seen. I mean, if it requires probably also that you have to ask the driller to stop. If you feel that it's a, that's a well-known area or that is predicted to be an overpressured area where you're drilling, then you can request the driller to stop drilling and circulate uh, to get all the uh, cuttings out of the hole and then check how much volume of cylinder getting cuttings you are giving you are getting is that okay okay sir thanks next question sir how can we predict the port pressure from dx component trend line but the exponent is a it's again, although it's a quantitative value, but the exponent itself, uh, in my uh, understanding, what we are getting today's uh, drilling, or uh, not just today's, almost 20 years back, we started drilling everything with the PDC bit. So where the ROP is the uh, only factor which is determining the completion of the well, you drill it fast and get rid of it and go to the next well. So uh, the PDC bit clearly is not a very suitable thing for our D exponent, but definitely if there is a uh, overpressure zone which is coming up, D exponent will certainly show it. 
and it's not just the de exponent it's pore pressure that's why i'm saying it's an integrated subject integrated uh, indicators also if you get a drag in the drill string it does not necessarily mean that you are having a differential or that kind of thing you have to look at other aspects so similarly in a de exponent what you're going to watch for is whether there has been a gas trend line change whether there has been a gas a background gas shift and whether there has been say cavings which is showing up in small portions but they are showing up so it's not just one particular uh, parameter which will lead you to uh, having a better control over the pressure estimation thank you sir so next question so we have 26 basin sedimentary basin but out of seven or six is only proven why another basins are not proven what are the geological consequences associated with that in india sir well this is not related to the topic but uh, in india basically uh, it's not just india in everywhere what happens is once you get oil somewhere you like to stick around those basin as much as you can so you start neglecting except some once in a while adventures into other basins like in vindhyan basin uh, bengal basin we have had uh, uh, you know momentous uh, journey into those basins drill wells and then didn't find anything then we stopped and we kept on acquiring data but there has never been a cohesive effort in getting to the bottom of that and uh, your question is very valid in terms of a more of a hydrocarbon industry perspective related rather than the over pressure related but yes it is it is just a habit uh, that when i get a oil i i let me go stick around there because ultimately oil is revenue why should i spend so much money so clearing a budget for such a thing you know and uh, and those difficult basins actually need difficult technologies to be implemented frankly not just the standard practice will yield values in them uh, in my opinion the world over there are a lot of uh, wildcat basins where uh, significant progress has been made are being made give, given the context that now this low oil price will definitely prevent uh, any CFO to give a clearance to drill a well there. The finance is the controller for everything that we do. So, uh, but when the oil price was high, also uh, there has been forays into such basins, and they have done tremendously uh, improved exploration campaigns. I, I should say what they were doing 20 years back, and now what they're doing is tremendous improvement. Seismic is a big tool uh, now. and seismic has improved in its uh, own way uh, so we are getting huge amount of information from seismic but also uh, for geophysics especially most of the geophysics actually look at the geophysics only and uh, we have to there is there is a very nice cartoon actually uh, on on a wavelet seismic wavelet on a rock exposure on a road side and if you see uh, you know one wavelet itself is not able to cover the whole rock exposure and imagine that rock exposure having so many numbers of layers with different textures and different uh, porosities permeabilities within them so seismic itself has a resolution issue while in log is the least that we have in a geophysical tool to have a resolution of 0.6 inches and, and sorry 6 inches and uh, the cores are the direct information but they are limited you cannot have a continuous core of 3000 feet or 10000 feet so they again they are limited but they are direct the cuttings yes we have all through but cuttings have the limitations of the depth connotations so very close to the casing point when you start drilling you have a better control of the cutting to the depth but as you go deeper away from the casing last casing 
here again the depth changes because again the calculations are based on a cylindrical shape and well is never cylindrical that way geometric so yeah that's 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 the scenario thank you sir and uh, the last question from saswat sir if we have less effective permeability of shell how do production happens from the shell ah. yeah if you remember that slide that i showed the shell as a source rock with over pressure changing over to a reservoir rock with over pressure now shell has a low permeability oil will not flow if you do not have permeability it's not just the shell even lot of carbonate rocks they have very less permeability and because they are very tight ultra tight sometimes they are like 2 2% porosity or even less than that and the permeabilities are in the range of 0.01 mDrc or something now in such kind of rocks you need to frack them and when you frack them there are various frack technologies now they have gone into the refract and the very latest being which came out from one of the big four service company is uh, they are actually doing earlier it used to be blind fracking you just frack it i don't know where it goes where is the stimulated reservoir volume i mean your fracking means you are actually stimulating that reservoir and but how far in which direction the things are going you don't know you don't have a grasp then they added micro seismic technology uh, to capture the impact of the fracture around the well bore how far it has gone in which direction continuous for the seismic these are the tools which are deployed because there without the frack you cannot produce so they kind of uh, understand the value of these technologies although they are expensive there is a value to it because the wells are shallower they are able to do it but otherwise what happens is when you do a fracking you have a stress model built in stress model which which is a part of the uh, they call it mechanical earth model or geomechanics model many terms are there and uh, from based on that they do a well orientation and based on that well orientation they do a fracking considering that the model even if they get 70% correct on that model they will have a larger uh, reservoir volume to be stimulated and the production will start but often that ha doesn't happen so the, because the shells are have a, they have a tendency to pull again come back even if you just pull the door apart the moment you leave your force there they will start collapsing the fractures will close down and the production will stop so the initial days of the shale gas actually they have been doing blindly stage fracking sometimes 50 stage fracking they were actually expensive and they realized these wells didn't even last few months of production and they closed down then they understood the importance of building every engineering aspect from back starting from the rock so unless you respect the rock your engineering is not going to be flawless so they started building up the stress models they started taking cores actually and then from the cores they did in situ stress modeling all those aspects are taken care and the frac industry itself evolved a lot so and that if you uh, remember in 2004 13 14 we had a recession and that time the shell gas even the good very good shell gas plays uh, where break even was around 60 dollars a barrel so equivalent so so if you do not have 60 dollars in the market price those shell plays are useless to be done and that is the time they were doing actually 100 dollars a barrel it was sold and so they were game changers now what happened is as the recession hit the uh, the price came down but in these two years a lot of people lost jobs rigs lost job frack units lost job thousands of them and everything collapsed in the shale gas industry but the technology improved in the background the frack technology improved in the background the drilling 
engineering improved in the background all these aspects uh, contributed to bringing down the break even from 60 to 45 dollars so even today if you have a 50 dollars a barrel the shale gas industry can run majority of the shale gas space shale gas also has different kinds of plays some are uh, having a low cost break even some are having a high cost break even depending on the complexity also size pool size is also very important so the frac industry has improved you have to do a frac to get your permeability within induced into the shells and you have to retain the permeability by introducing propellants and other agents which will remain the way it's just imagine a green peas you open the green peas you have the peas uh, of a particular size so the skin will not collapse below that particular size so it's something like frack is something like that the propons are the peas thank you sir so i think uh, no more question from the participant and if it will be there we will simply forward to your mail sir so thank you so much participant and thank you so much sir for your precious time thank I, you it was, a pleasure. it was a pleasure from my side and uh, uh, definitely this uh, presentation was more of a basic in nature purposefully keeping the audience in the perfect perspective and uh, the advanced people actually a lot of my juniors who were there in reliance industries uh, they can beat me hands down on this particular topic actually so and they are all well established <laughs> many of them are there so i hope everything was satisfactory and it has been able to generate some kind of interest and also respect for each other's discipline thanks so much perfect sir and last but not least i would like to thank mr sukanta de associate professor at kiel university who really helped for arranging this webinar session so the team petroleum engineers association ou sir and a special thanks to mr pradeep mukherjee sir we are founder of team petroleum engineers association and participant for your precious and wonderful time hoping to see you soon sir and participant in our upcoming webinar soon and have a good day and thank you so much sir thank you so much participant everyone and yes don't worry about your certificate those who have filled the feedback form and those who have joined the whatsapp group that will get your certificate within seven working days so again at last thank you so much sir thank you have a good day good and weekend thank you so much participant you too sir have a good day sir take care bye bye